Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jemily Gomez, and I am at the Salazar Center at Colorado State University. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conservation conversation. This is a collaboration of 10 university centers that works to highlight solutions in climate conservation and environment. And if you are joining us uh, for the first time today, uh, this is actually the final in our series and you can find all of our previous uh, great conversations on our website. A little bit of housekeeping, this session is being recorded. A link to the recording will be sent via email to all registrants within the next couple days. All attendees are on mute, but we would love to hear your questions throughout. You can use that question box on the control panel. As I mentioned, we have a whole host of other great webinars that we've covered on these topics. You can find all of them at conservationconversations.org. And with that, I want to introduce Jordan Smith from Utah State University, who will be the host for today. Jordan, I think we I can hear you there. I share my screen, uh, Dominique. Yep. Let me go ahead and do that. Great, well, thanks, Dominique, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, like Dominique mentioned, my name is Jordan Smith. I'm with the Institute uh, of Outdoor Recreation and Tourism at Utah State University. I'm gonna begin by providing some statistics uh, to set the stage for today's discussion. Um, if the past nine months have taught us anything, it's that Americans love our public lands. They've turned to them to connect with their families, to maintain an active lifestyle and to escape 24-hour news cycles that seem to bring nothing but bad news. The recreation, recreational use of our public lands received is not a new trend, however. <clears throat> Visitation to many of our national parks has reached record levels every year. And over the past 10, 10 years, visitation to national park units uh, has increased by 16% with national parks alone seeing an increase of 28% over that same period of time. At the same time, the ecosystems of our public lands are changing notably. National parks as a whole are warming at twice the rate as the rest of the country and precipitation is declining faster. As a result, we are losing some of the outstanding resources our parks and forests were established to protect in the first place. Uh, this example here from Jackson Glacier and Glacier National Park is a prime example. Many national forests are also struggling to maintain trails and campgrounds under the weight of more intense and diverse use. Uh, visitation to national forests is up 5% over the last 10 years as well. More use of our forests has been associated with the increased occurrence of human-caused wildfires. And there's many of these unforeseen colliding forces bringing climate change and the increased demand for outdoor recreation together that we still have yet to experience, um, but are right around the corner. The challenges of visitation that are seen uh, in our national forests and national parks are also being seen in our state park systems. Visitation to state parks is up nearly 10% across the country since 2019. Simultaneously, operating budgets have declined by over 21%. Recent research has estimated that we'll need about $42 billion in additional appropriations and revenues to state park systems to meet the projected demand. These are complex management challenges that different agencies are dealing with in very different ways. And we have an excellent panel on today to discuss these challenges. We have Jeff Moe, who became the 22nd superintendent of Glacier National Park in August of 2013. A 31-year veteran of the National Park Service, Moe served 21 of those years in Alaska at various parks, including Kenai Fjords, Denali, Glacier Bay, and Gates of the Arctic. We also have Michiko Martin, who is the Director of Recreation, Heritage, and Volunteer Resources for the USDA Forest Service and leads efforts to connect people 
to the outdoors through our nation's forests and grasslands and to inspire the next generation of conservation leaders. Next, we have Lewis Ledford, who serves as the executive director of the National Association of State Park Directors. The NASPD is the nonprofit organization whose membership represents America's state parks that encompass 6,792 areas, including parks, recreation areas, natural areas, historic and scientific sites comprising more than 18 million acres of visitation, 18 million acres with visitation that exceeds 813 million visits annually. Finally, we have Dr. Chris Mons, a professor of recreation resource management in the Department of Environment and Society here at Utah State University. Chris teaches courses in wildland recreation management, ecolog ecological impacts of recreation, public lands planning cons and conservation, nature-based tourism, and interpretation. Jeff, we'll begin with your remarks on how the National Park Service and Denali National Park in particular are dealing with these challenges related to increased visitation. Great, thank you, Jordan. Um, it's a pleasure to be uh, with all of you uh, today. Um, this is a most relevant topic for all of us. Literally last hour, I was on a call with uh, county commissioners, uh, state, park, uh, state park and state land representatives, as well as uh, the Forest Service to talk about some of these very same issues uh, with regards to what, do we, what should we be thinking about for 2021 in the face of what we faced in 2020 with um, this extraordinary level of uh, visitation that we had to this area uh, in and around Glacier National Park in Northwest Montana. Um, you know, the, uh, I, I think I'm here to present a unit specific uh, perspective. And, uh, you know, so let me talk a little bit about our geography, which, you know, I do want to acknowledge as a traditional homelands of the Blackfeet, Salish and Kootenai people. Uh, the Blackfeet would call Glacier National Park or the area uh, known as Glacier National Park as um, the Stockus, meaning backbone of the world. And uh, um, about 100 years ago, uh, George Bird Grinnell uh, coined the term crown of the continent. And I think that was based on the idea that the watersheds leaving this area um, are river systems that feed Hudson Bay, Gulf of Mexico, and uh, the Columbia River drainage, which is pertinent in this conversation in the sense of what visitors do uh, while they're here makes a huge difference on the integrity of some of those resources. So um, Glacier is amongst, um, as uh, the 10th most visited national park unit, um, our visitation has been growing for, for, for some time. Uh, seven years ago, during my first year as a superintendent, uh, we actually, I was, had the opportunity to welcome the 100 millionth visitor to Glacier National Park. So it took us uh, about 103 years to reach the 100 million mark in terms of visitors to the park. But um, at current visitation rates, um, it'll be a quarter or a third that, uh, of that time before we reach the next 100 million. So those are all things uh, probably for my successors to be thoughtful about and thinking about it. Being so far north in, in the lower 48, uh, Glacier is in that sweet spot of vulnerability. That vulnerability is, is driven by the very, very short seasons we have. And, and our visitation curve is really more like a, a, in, you know, a, a very steep uh, inverted V. It's uh, uh, even, uh, I spent so many of my years working in Alaska, but even the season here at Glacier is shorter than, than what uh, you might find in Alaska. Um, the going to the Sun Road, which is our uh, prime visitation uh, location, uh, most where most of our visitors go. Um, this year, for example, uh, it wasn't open to the public till July 9th, and um, it got closed by uh, winter weather, which is set in on October 9th. So it, it that sort of very short season means it's very vulnerable in terms of. Um, you know, how we gear up for it, but also for businesses that depend on visitors coming to the area um, is, is uh, it makes it very, very challenging. Glacier generates about almost half a billion dollars in direct visitors spending in and around the area. So it's a huge economic driver for Northwest Montana. Um, as, as Jordan said, you know, over the past uh, 10 years, we've seen um, significant increase in visitation at Glacier that number, that number is 64% increase in uh, visitors over the last 10 years. 
And uh, many of the uh, you know, top five years of visitation have just been in the last uh, seven years. Um, leading up to 2020, I would say we've been noticing the change in demographic to uh, Glacier National Park, the number of visitors who had never been to a national park before. I know when I was um, in my sort of college years uh, visiting national parks, that Glacier was not a place you went to sort of just on the spur of the moment. They had grizzly bears. They had, you know, significant hazards that, that you had to be aware of. Um, but certainly we feel that today uh, there's no hesitation coming to Glacier. Social media sort of totally sort of uh, overridden a lot of those cautionary uh, aspects of, of coming to a, um, a landscape such as, as glaciers. Um, we've also, um, over the last several years, we've, we've actually reached capacity at some of the venues in the park when we've actually had to close them down. We've used some different strategies on how we manage that, but um, we really are dealing with some uh, capacity issues in the park. Now, 2020 was a very different year, and, and primarily, I think, um, you know, we would have been on track with Yellowstone and Grand Teton, uh, the two other uh, prominent national parks in, in our general area, with seeing increased visitation over 2019. But because of COVID, um, the east side of the park, all our venues on the east side of the park remained closed because the Blackfeet Reservation was closed to all non-essential um, traffic uh, due to uh, the concern over an outbreak and the ongoing outbreak. And then they had literally been in shutdown for most of the summer and even, even uh, continues to this day. You know, as we all know, um, Native American populations are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of uh, COVID-19 uh, on, on their uh, households and communities. So also the uh, the reopening and coming out of uh, shutdown um, was a late start to the season of us for us. And so when we look at our visitation for 2020, we're about half of what we would normally see. Um, the only issue is for the first time in history, we only had one entrance to, to accommodate those visitors, which was about 1.2 million visitors that came through over the course, just since uh, we opened on June 9th uh, to the present. Um, that very focused use, we brought forth many, many issues that we'd been seeing at some of our other venues, but we we were uh, suffered from some of those issues um, right in our going to the Sun Road corridor, which is one of our primary venues and which had historically never really suffered as, as critically as some of these other places. So it's been very, very challenging. We've had, um, we've had to close the entrance several times. Uh, we've had long lines of uh, cars lined up on Highway 2 waiting to turn in uh, to the park. Uh, we've had reports of visitors waiting for an hour just to get to the west entrance to find out that um, uh, there was no capacity in the park for them to, to come in. So these are sort of these critical issues that uh, we really need to focus on in, in thinking about and, and working forward. We actually had the opportunity this summer to, to look at ticketed entry, that idea of, uh, that um, a couple other park units had employed this summer, uh, Yosemite and, and uh, Rocky Mountain National Parks. But um, we looked at it, we socialized it, had a lot of conversation with our local communities and decided in the end not to implement it. Um, we would have implemented right at the end of July. So it literally would have been halfway through the summer. And um, it was just, there was, too many challenges for us to overcome. But I can tell you that uh, given what we saw through September, through our Labor Day period, and even into October, I've been approached by many in the community to say, is there a way we can talk about ticketed entry this winter? And so uh, that remains to be seen. Um, there's some, you know, and, and again, you know, it's up to the community to bring that to me as a manager in order for us to have those conversations. So, um, We've had a long history of, of engaging with the community. I've been approached for as long as I've been at Glacier about this whole uh, topic of how do we not strangle the goose that lays the golden eggs. There's many in the community that are concerned about it. Certainly with COVID and the influx that we saw of out-of-state visitors, um, as well as you know not just visitors that came just to visit the park, but visitors that actually came to move here and bought property. There's reportedly 
you know, almost a 30% increase in, um, uh, this comes from, from our depart local department of motor vehicles saying there's a 30% increase in the number of uh, motor vehicle uh, license transfers from other states, you know, reflecting that sort of influx of, of, of new residents. So, um, you know, we have that sort of dichotomy as it were between local visitors, uh, our local population that, that, that appreciates the amenity of Glacier in their backyard. And then we have those destination visitors. And I think COVID-19 really brought forward some of those conflicts uh, associated with that. Um, so, you know, um, moving forward, there's there's much from uh, for us to learn about, or that we learned about in 2020 that we'll be taking into 2021. We're also uh, learning from our uh, other parks that did implement uh, ticketed uh, uh, entries and or other systems to uh, manage with the numbers that they had. And, uh, you know, it's a constant learning process and, and uh, thinking about uh, best practices. Um, next steps, I think is, is, you know, some of those next steps or things, lessons that we learned is really about expectations. What are the expectations of our visitors both um, uh, those that are local residents, those that are the destination visitors, and quite honestly, it's the expectations of ourselves as the National Park Service, because we are seeing numbers and uses that we've never seen before, and, 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 and it, it's rocking our world, I think, in terms of, of what we expect uh, our visitors, uh, how they should behave, or what they should know when they come to national parks. And that really, I think, speaks to the new audiences that we're seeing um, that are coming. Uh, I think the new audiences that we, we've always seen those new audiences, but I think what COVID brought to us is that accelerated increase in those uh, new audiences, uh, given that they weren't able to go to Canada, they weren't able to travel uh, uh, overseas, that, uh, you know, that there's just the interest in national parks increased significantly. So some of the things that we're really focused on is real-time information, um, how can we do a better job so that people don't have to wait in the line of cars for an hour before realizing they're not going to get into the park? Um, that's, a, that's a real critical one that I want to sort of see if I, we can solve. Um, I think it's important for how do we get the message across for our visitors that they should be thinking plan A, plan B, plan C. Uh, from my time in Alaska, that was always the word we gave to visitors because there were so many things that could go wrong weather-wise, itinerary-wise, planes can't come in to pick you up, that you always have to have those plans A, B, C, and D so that, you know, if plan A didn't work out, plan B was going to be right there and, and, and can provide a, a great experience too. And uh, certainly in the conversation I had last hour is about how do we pr present a more unified message about recreate, responsibly, recreate responsibly, which is one of those messages that came out of uh, the COVID-19 and, and, and Colorado specifically about, you know, these new audiences. How do we address some of those very basic things about picking up toilet paper, taking care of your own litter, not bringing dogs to the park, not picking flowers in the park? There are some very basic things that my staff um, had to address this year that sort of, uh, you know, rock their worlds because of some of these new audiences that we want to welcome but we also want to provide them with the, the proper stewardship uh, uh, practices uh, when they come to our public lands. So um, much of my work this winter will be engaged uh, working collaboratively with, with state, county, and uh, other federal uh, agencies on how we can provide some of those messages and communicate to these new audiences and help set some of those expectations for our visitors. So. That's a, a quick overview of a, a local perspective on, on how we look at and think about these uh, numbers that we're uh, seeing coming to places like Glacier National Park. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Michiko, I think we'll turn to you next. The Forest Service has begun implementing shared stewardship agreements to leverage partnerships and manage and to make to manage and maintain outdoor recreation opportunities. Um, let's turn it over to you now to hear more about what the Forest Service is doing to to deal with visitation right now. Great, thanks so much, Jordan. Uh, just quick audio and video check. Yep, that looks good. Okay, wonderful. 
So thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, Jordan, thank you for you to you and all the sponsors for um, bringing us and convening us together on this really timely and important topic. So I will be giving a perspective from the USDA Forest Service on some of what we felt over the last few months and um, really highlighting some of um, some of the solutions and uh, the partnerships that we're looking forward to, to taking us um, to taking us into the future. So similar to the Park Service and some of the numbers that Jeff outlined, we saw some dramatic visitation um, over the last few months. Now, if you can remember the hierarchy of the, or the arc of COVID, we were largely um, had shelter in place um, orders all across the nation from about March to the uh, end of May. And so you see in this graph that May, our numbers are comparable to last year. Then if you look at the uh, orange color tone and comparing it to 2019, June, July, August, and September, our numbers are just huge um, up. If you see in September, we're about three times higher the visitation than we were just a year ago. Looking at it a different way, this is just a snapshot in August, but we've broken it up here to different kinds of recreation. And what you see here is that our day use was up about twice it was um, about five years ago. General forested areas up about one and a half times, overnight sites uh, up about three times, as was visitation to our wilderness areas. And as Jeff alluded to, we saw some significant increase in the number of first time visitors. In fact, we saw a 150% increase in folks who were coming to national forest areas for their first time ever. Um, it, it's it's wonderful to have that kind of new visitation, it truly is, but it does also present to us some challenges. So how did we feel this or how did we see this? I'm gonna just share a couple of quick images with you to see how it was initially reflected. Some of these images come from times when we were still in shelter in place orders and where folks were supposed to be staying at home, but they weren't. And so, um, you know, certainly our staff was trying to shelter in place as much as possible too. And we didn't always have folks that were out there um, to be able to respond to the unexpected visitation during these shelter at home times. But then as more and more folks started to visit our areas, we had a lot of uh, visitors who were just not familiar with what is acceptable and what's not acceptable in common spaces. And so um, many visitors who simply did not know um, leave no trace principles or other kinds of stewardship ethics. Some of our forest managers and land managers were expressing to us inordinate amount of visitation. Um, these kinds of parking situations where uh, cars are lined up, you know, far beyond our boundaries for sure, and certainly encroaching into uh, shared road spaces. You know, what we were getting was reports of it feels like the 4th of July visitation every single weekend, and in some cases, every single day. So we certainly were feeling a lot more visitation than, um, than we were expecting. And as I mentioned earlier, visitors in some cases who just don't know what's proper and what's not proper, not having the sense to not leave graffiti and other kinds of markings or to not shoot at, um, at bathrooms and, and other, um, other structural buildings. So just a lot of um, what we would normally consider as inappropriate behavior. Sometimes there was a sense of law lawlessness. Um, our, Many of our officials shared with us that um, some of the visitors ha almost had this feeling like if you don't get caught, it's OK. So in this image, you, you see um, here where it's clearly saying motor vehicle use is not prohibited, but where you can also clearly see tracks in the land showing um, that folks clearly went into an area where the sign tells them that it, you know, they, they really should be staying off of that area. So, you know, that was some of the ways that um, some of the negative ways that this increase in visitation was felt to us. The silver lining, as Dr. Smith mentioned, you know, the true silver lining is that um, this time gave us a glimpse into how important outdoor recreation and natural spaces are to our residents of this country. I mean, that is the, the good way to look at it, right? That we now understand even more than we did before how important it, um, these lands are to, to our residents. You know, I think that the pandemic, if you just think about your own experience, it induced a great amount of stress. You know, certainly people were having to learn how to work differently, how to teach differently, how to live differently, how to um, 
how to learn differently. Many of you became teachers of, of school age children. And so I think that all this stress led to people to try to find an escape and to try to find an outlet that was safe and healthy. And they turned to their natural areas. And, you know, we, it's wonderful as outdoor recreation providers. I think we all know this is wonderful because we are well aware of the research that shows us that time out in nature leads to joy. It, you know, it leads to improvements in cognition, to happiness, um, to self-esteem, and even to physical improvements such as boost to the immunity. So we know this from the literature. And so it's wonderful that folks turn to our outdoor areas, but it also presented us some new challenges as we dealt with um, brand new audiences and influxes of and volumes of audiences at unprecedented levels. So what are some of the things that we turn to? Partners. Partners are who continue to help us see the way forward and help us to address the hardest challenges that we face. Partners like many of you and, um, and certainly uh, like this coalition that, that's here today. One of the partnerships that Jeff mentioned that, that the Forest Service was also a, um, a member of is the Recreate Responsibly Coalition um, that is a group of over 700 different um, NGOs, state governments, businesses, federal governments, and others participating in. Um, largely uh, under the leadership of REI, but um, certainly with the wonderful leadership of many uh, of you in, in your state and other states. We were really glad to participate in this um, particular co coalition, and we found some wonderful um, responsiveness to the sharing of our stories. So we would come into the forum, say, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're experiencing from some of the visitors who, who don't know, um, how, you know how, to, how to behave differently. And then the Recreate Responsibility Coalition would respond with, okay, why don't we think about different ways to provide social media or to provide uh, billboards or other kinds of communication devices in order to reach this audience in a different way. So we were very happy to participate in Recreate Responsibly. And um, one of the other ways that we participated was through our partnership in Recreation.gov. You may know, but many of many folks don't know that the Forest Service is the federal manager of Recreation.gov on behalf of a dozen other uh, federal agencies. And so this is a wonderful partnership that also was able to serve as part of the solution for um, the entire COVID pandemic. Uh, early in the um, pandemic, um, Recreation.gov had to pivot and had to figure out how do we um, let customers know that they won't be able to visit the campground that they had a reservation for. How do how do we it re, um, issue refunds? How do we really be um, proactive in helping people understand how they might be able to find experiences closer to where they are, they are supposed to shelter in place? But then certainly as we approach May and then on into the summer, we had to change our model and really embrace things like Recreate Responsibly, which we used heavily on our recreation.gov platform to teach people how to prepare to, for their experience, whether it was on a um, park site or on a forest service site or any of the other dozen uh, federal partners. Jeff alluded to some of the solutions that we, the partnership came up with. Um, so I'm just gonna hit, highlight a couple of them. Um, one was the fact that we did uh, use timed entry. So this was used at places like Rocky Mountain National Park or El Junque uh, National Forest in Puerto Rico, where we helped visitors um, time their visitation so that we could better control the amount of visitors that were in that area at any one time um, to COVID mitigated safe levels. Another kind of innovation was, was one that was used in Yosemite, which was issuing um, essentially day passes where they had a certain number of reservations, folks could go on it um, and reserve that pass, and, and you know, which was good for the duration of that day. So we helped to bring different kinds of innovations into um, the reservation world so that we could provide COVID mitigations while also providing folks this way to get out in nature in, in a safe way. And then certainly, as I already mentioned, we shared all of the Recreate Responsibly messaging very heavily on our recreation.gov site from everywhere from the point where they even jump onto the site, even in exploring their options, all the way through the point where we are reminding them of their reservation and reminding them of some of the tips that they might want to keep in mind before they step foot in, um, in, in their recreation area of choice. 
Another kind of way that we are looking to partner to help be part of the solution is through this wonderful investment of the Great American Outdoors Act, which was uh, just passed in August of this year. This gives the Forest Service about $285 million per year for, uh, for the next five years for us to, um, to address deferred maintenance needs on our national forest lands. We were only given a very short uh, time frame from the passage of this act in August. Um, we, we were given about 60 days to forward a list of projects to, um, to uh, our Office of Management and Budget uh, for approval. Despite having this short time frame, we still took advantage of the opportunity to meet with many members of our public, key stakeholders, and also hosting um, several uh, roundtables and listening sessions so we could really get a better sense from our public on how they would like us to prioritize our deferred maintenance. This year was odd um, just because our, our time frame was short. Um, as we move forward into the um, upcoming years, we do hope to broaden that ability to work more with our public to understand how you will want us to prioritize those areas that are important to you. So how can Utahns um, specifically uh, feel this? I would strongly encourage you to reach out to your national forest. They are waiting for you to hear your input, to understand how you would like us to invest in things like trails, trailheads, bridges, um, other recreation site infrastructure, so that we can really ensure that we are um, fulfilling the Great American Outdoors Act in a way that is most meaningful to you. The last thing that I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, what is formally known as shared stewardship agreements. When we talk about shared stewardship, we really are just recognizing that we need not just invite, we need partners to be with us that, to take this all um, hands, all lands approach. We recognize that it is insufficient for us to simply look at our borders, and we re recognize that it is insufficient for us to be the only one looking in those borders. We know that we need everyone to be with us to together to look at land, all lands, together and figure out how we can, in this case, provide for re recreational opportunities to all the residents that, and citizens who want to come and visit our lands. So that's what we mean by shared stewardship. It's how do we work with all our partners to achieve the collective good. But we also have something that's known as formal shared stewardship agreements. Um, we have uh, 44 states that are involved in these formal agreements. Utah is one of those. Um, your your Utah governor governor signed this agreement in May of 2019, um, and so thank you. We we do appreciate your support for that. Um, and these formal agreements really provide us the formalized language that defines that federal and state partnership. I'm going to highlight Oregon for just a moment because um, Oregon took the opportunity to really introduce some language into their formal shared stewardship agreement that recognize the importance of outdoor recreation. The reason I'm highlighting this one, because I think it's a wonderful model, and in our agreement with Utah, we recognize that there are opportunities to revise this agreement, certainly to revise it in five-year increments, but to revise it in increments that are shorter than that if Utah wants. So I would invite you on this call that if this is something, if this is a model that you like, really talk to um, the sponsors of this program, talk to us, talk, you know, talk to others um, in state government who can try to um, emulate what Oregon has done and bring it into a Utah context. So what I love about um, what Oregon is that their leaders, their state leaders actually wrote language into the agreement that ask, asks for us to specifically bring together to quote, look for quality outdoor opportunities for all Oregonians, end of quote. And that, um, it, it seems like such a simple sentence, but it, it, it does provide us the legal and the um, formal framework so that we can together pursue partnerships specifically to, to address outdoor recreation opportunities. And how this is now being felt is that one of the ways that Oregon and the Forest Service is um, hoping to address this is through a partnership that is resulting in the Pacific Northwest Trails um, stewardship. And we are looking at ways that we can partner specifically um, with the state and partners, so not only the state, but all, but you know, within the state with all the partners to, to take a more, um, again, all lands approach to how we can offer 
trails and trail opportunities um, to all Oregon Oregonians, regardless of where they're starting from. We don't want them to only have to start from Forest Service land to get the wonderful benefits of being on trails. And so um, I'm simplifying it, but I, I just use this as a model to hopefully inspire um, those of you in Utah to want to pursue something similar like this. Um, and so again, you know, I would really encourage you to uh, talk with your state leaders and your other, you know, university um, leaders and partners to, to see if we might want to consider a similar partnership for Utah and the Forest Service. We, however, I don't want you to um, leave thinking that that we don't have wonderful partnerships already existing in Utah. We, we certainly do. Um, and one of our most rich partnerships with Utah is, of course, with the Office of Outdoor Recreation. We love your outdoor um, office of your Office of Outdoor Recreation. You are certainly a leader in the nation. You should be very, very proud of that. And um, we are always at the ready to help um, and and be a good partner to you, so that we can make that office a success for not only all Utahns but really for all Americans, because again, you are a model of wonderful, uh, a wonderful office. And, and I really do think that a lot of other states out there could learn from, from what you all have uh, going on in Utah. But beyond that, I just wanna give maybe, I'll, I'll stop at one more, one more example of um, how we might be partnering it specifically for the benefit of Utah. Um, we have this wonderful program in the Fish Lake um, National Forest, uh, working on the, with the Paiute Trail Association, where hand in hand with this um, association, we worked um, to try to identify um, opportunities for um, to improve trails for all types of trail users, inclu including OHV use. And so this is a really neat example where we recognize um, all the different kinds of users who want to come on trails, and we um, work together to improve the offerings for all, all folks who, who visit our lands. So that's just one um, minute example, and my uh, colleagues from the Forest Service know <laughs> they're, they're probably laughing right now because I, I'm doing a disservice to all of the rich uh, ways that we partner um, in Utah. But again, I just wanted to stress the opportunity um, to formalize a partnership with Utah through the formal shared stewardship agreements as a way to really provide us some strong legal uh, framework upon which to build. So I'm going to stop right there, Jordan, and turn it back over to you um, and hope that I did um, provide a glimpse into some of the challenges that the Forest Service is facing, but also some of the ways that we are looking to our partners to really help us meet those challenges in providing more rich opportunities um, for all Americans. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks to some of the rest of my panel members and you, audience. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Michiko. Lewis, I want to turn it over to you now. <laughs> We had talked about in the introduction that the nation's state park systems accommodate over 800 million visits annually, and each of them has a, a very distinct uh, approach to how they're managing visitation. I was hoping that you could lend your perspective from kind of overseeing all 50 state park systems and how they've been uh, responding to this uh, dramatic changes in visitation uh, across the country. Thank you, Jordan. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good, Lewis. Good, good. Well, thank you for this introduction. I join, I join uh, uh, Jeff and Michiko saying thank you to all involved for bringing these conversations about conservation together. And, and as I like to start off here, just to briefly, if you will, to kind of set the stage and give a little bit of an overview of America's state parks. Um, 6,800 areas almost, uh, 18 and a half million acres quite a diversity or mosaic of, across the country from the highest mountains in the east to fossil beds on the Ohio River and in, in Indiana to uh, sites where Europeans first came to America in, in um, Virginia and in, in Massachusetts, uh, a Native American buffalo jumps in Montana and even the John Penny Kemp uh, State Park, uh, the Coral Reef State Park, underwater park, if you will, in South Florida. Uh, it's quite, a, quite an extensive collection of areas but as Jordan referenced, the, the visitation, I think that's what surprises most folks when you start talking about America State Parks, over 813 million visitors in our last uh, survey. And of course, those are pre-COVID numbers, and we'll talk more about what's happened since then. But $2.8 billion in, in operational expenditures is quite an economic impact, and nearly a, a billion dollars in, 
in capital developments each year, and you saw those numbers of reductions, but also the growth of parks in terms of visitation. But I think it's important for all of us to think about that, you know, with the federal partners we've just heard from combined with state parks, we're a million and a half plus, excuse me, a billion and a half plus uh, visitors coming to these federal outdoor and state recreation sites each year, plus the other uh, federal uh, recreation sites. So almost 900 billion, the fourth largest economic sector is this outdoor recreation impact in America. Well, again, about state parks, you know, we're quite a quite a group of programming from first day hikes to opt outside to um, uh, so many other things that people think about when they think of going to the outdoors. Um, quite a collection of facilities from the famed CCC camper cabins and cabins of those era, that early era, to uh, contemporary cottages and states and. And frankly, with nearly 230,000 campsites, the largest collection of camping um, opportunities out there. Well, let's talk just a little bit, set a scene a little bit more. You know, of course, most folks think of Niagara Falls as being the first continuously operated state parks. Uh, it's uh, dating back to uh, uh, the late 1800s. And then another one across our country, so many people are increasingly familiar with the Valley of Fire in Nevada. And, what a scenic icon that location is, but you can go to Alaska and the TikTok, uh, Wood TikTok Chick uh, State Park there, some 1.6 million acres, uh, quite a vast uh, array of parks in, in the, the northern country. And many of you probably familiar with Chigach in the Anchorage area or further back south, you can go to Arizona and from Slide Rock and Sedona to the Karchner Cabins with the world's largest lap pipe again. Don't mean to spend too much time talking about these state parks, but there's quite a quite a mosaic of what makes America special in the outdoors, in addition to those in the na national areas we've been talking about or hearing from. So what happened in March? Oh, I think we all know that story. The impacts is suddenly here. You can see some scenes from uh, northern uh, South Carolina, Table Rock Mountain, where suddenly, with all the other places being closed, the malls and the schools and the other entertainment venues being closed down, parks suddenly, if they're ever were becoming more and more essential. What else happened? Safety, safety of the visitors, impacts on the natural resources. I always remember having a conversation and joining a conference call with the, the managers of Arkansas State Parks in late March, and they were doing their best to try to keep the parks open. There were so many unknowns. The, the safety, their personal safety, the visitor safety, the resource impacts, and they were doing their best with all the disaffectives and everything they could to keep the parks open, but yet the, the public that were coming were not using them. There was so much unknown. It was, it was quite a nightmare. And so what happened? Closures. Parks started closing. State systems started closing down for safety and health and impact resource impact reasons. And so this map, I, I can't guess, is the worst case scenario map of our country, middle of April when 12 state park systems had totally closed every entrance and all opportunities to visit their state park systems. Um, you can see the others in red, 30 states that only had day use. And many, many of those states, except for one or two areas, would, could have been colored black because they virtually were closed. So much of a challenge. And of course, we took our share of uh, some media and public pushback, you know, for why are we uh, closing the parks at a time that they were needed so much. As of this week, you can see we've rebounded some. Parks have come back quite a bit. Um, you can see that uh, six are truly, totally open with all their facilities. And I'll give credit to Alabama and Georgia and Kansas and some others that basically kept their park systems open and overnight accommodations throughout this pandemic. But as you can see, some states still have, most states still have some uh, limitations on their use. And those in the Northeast have kind of had a coalition or pack like the, that Northeast group, you can see those states require a 14 uh, day quarantine or a negative uh, COVID test uh, within 72 hours if you're out of state from one of those states to visit their parks. New Mexico currently until the November 13th are only allowing their uh, in-state citizens to use their parks overnight. I thought I would just show some selected examples and conversations that I've had recently with some of the other states. As we've heard from the other uh, presenters, the visitation trends have not fallen off. In fact, 
as Labor Day came and we've come into October and the fall color season, frankly, has continued to remain very high in Maryland. You know, Maryland is a densely populated area, as you would know, in our country. And the capacity closures are not uncommon. As you can see, they had 101 times in the state last year, they, in 2019, that they closed the parks due to capacity. This year, you can see it's almost three times as much. Uh, one of the things that really helped them is you'll hear me talk about some of the other states. Day use reservations was were implemented that really tried to help uh, allow folks to use the parks, structure the times that people could get to the parks. You know, so oftentimes we think of overnight reservations, but the day use reservations program really became very popular in a number of states. They also sought to focus impact and share a, a communication strategy with the citizens about the impacts that this is on the state park system and uh, talk to them about the resource damage as well as trying to improve the quality of the experience. There's a lot of conversation that I think all of us need to have about um, do we need to establish more parks, natural areas, trails, facilities, and certainly we need more park resources. If we're gonna manage these forests and parks in this kind of climate and with the continuing trends that we saw prior to COVID, We've got to improve the resources and the Great Out Americans Outdoor Act that the Michigan mentioned is going to be incredibly important because it also provides more equitable allocations to uh, local and state governments. During the year in the summer, you probably saw those scenes from Florida with the beaches being crowded when they started reopening. Well, here's late summer views in Florida where the inland parks continue extremely uh, high visitation. One of our, another one of our well-managed park systems, Texas was one of the, I guess, the largest state park system to close down. And so much analysis went into place about what, how to best manage and how to reopen and how to reopen safely. And they're having an advanced day use reservation program prior to COVID was really important, but it was critical during COVID to have times where people could reserve times that they could, that they could come to the parks. And during this pandemic, Parks that had rarely, if ever, saw capacity increased their visitation to the capacity. Certainly, it, it's important that many of us, as we manage these special outdoor places, evaluate the need of what the carrying capacities are for the parks. Up in the upper right, you can see the calls coming into their call center for reservations and park information. Overall, in those six months, a 54% increase just in calls coming in about wanting to make reservations or use the parks. We had planned to host our annual national conference of all the state park directors that Michigan spoke at last year in Arkansas. We were going to be in Western uh, Pennsylvania and, near, and even participate in um, the Site 93 uh, commemoration, but uh, it just didn't allow for it. But as you can see, continuing just two weeks ago at Kinsua Bridge State Park, look at the, the visitation that's continuing to be strong. And John uh, Hallis, the, the director there, shared with me some of the thoughts he had about what's making the system work as well as it can under these conditions. And that's that strong coordination with the external local partners, you know, the law enforcement, the Chamber of Commerce, um, the EMS, and those other folks, strong communication strategies, and programming and resource staff starting to be more focused on stewardship issues. And he's putting a lot of emphasis on uh, continuing into the next year about dealing with these uh, impacts and mitigate them from aquatic terrestrial invasives and gear checks and cleaning and leave no trace, and the climate and the fire and the wildlife. I speak climate, I think of, I spoke with the Louisiana director um, yesterday. This is the seventh time due to a tropical storm this year that they've had to evacuate the Louisiana state park systems in the southern part of the state. Quite a challenge. Of course, virtually all the states back to Pennsylvania have done so much to try to put up these uh, social distancing and leave no trace and CDC kind of uh, uh, signage and communication strategies to, to manage the crowds as well as the impacts on the resources. New Hampshire State Parks, if you've been there, you know some of the most scenic and beautiful parks in the Northeast, pretty spectacular Mount Washington and Monadnock and the Flume Gorge. Um, as I talked to the folks there about what they went through, they said one of the things they started trying to do was control the crush. 
you know, the reservation systems, and again, they went to a day use reservation systems, even in some of these expansive areas, they went to a, a, a day use reservation system. They'd had one previously and uh, expanding it this year added to it. One of the things they thought was very important was adequate enforcement to support a reservation system. You can put those in place, but if you don't have staff and managers out there, it's, it's practically impossible to uh, administer. A lot of communication about controlling public expectations. You know, the visitors can uh, no longer assume the park is always going to be available. It's kind of like that old uh, um, adage of bagging something or uh, antlers on the wall. I mean, you've got to understand that just being available to get it is not the norm anymore. It may take a while for folks to understand this thought, but it's worked well so far in New Hampshire with camping. Increasing capacity where appropriate. I think all of us got to step back and look where we can increase capacity, but where we got to be more restrictive. And some of the key elements as we move forward in responding to pandemics is the culture of the organization. You know, a lot of state and government and federal employees and so forth were working from home or were not allowed to be out. But the parks people, and especially in the case of New Hampshire and many other states, administrative staff from the central offices went out into the parks trying to um, aid this crush of people that's coming in uh, to better manage it and really put a system in place that limits the crowds. And of course, I want to speak a little bit about financial resources. You know, we've talked a lot about, and I think Jordan introduced about our uh, generation of revenue. New Hampshire State Parks now generate 100% of their revenue to operate their park system through their fees and structures uh, to raise revenue. And that's critically important, and it's really been a challenge. Um, during the past year, I'm reminded of Indiana State Parks when the director there in May told me that he was closing all the wedding opportunities and all the reservations. And you can imagine all the other impacts that had, but just in Indiana alone for one month was a net loss of $100,000 in revenue just from uh, weddings that were taking place across the state. One of the things that Michigan did that uh, I think has worked well for them is they delegated the authority to their state park managers or park superintendents to reduce their parking capacities. Perhaps some of their parking areas were larger than their resources could uh, manage or uh, properly sized. And so they gave the authority to their managers to limit the size and the number of parking spaces that would be available. And they've allowed that to remain in effect uh, through this day and plan to continue moving forward. As we start to wind up, let's just share a couple others that uh, Virginia State Parks, you can see at Pocahontas State Park here, they, whenever they had concerts or some of the traditional uh, activities associated with that park, they spaced them out and uh, continue to try to have those. Indiana State Parks, I think this photo on the bottom right is from uh, Brown County in the southern part of the state. Like so many other states, they physically started closing off areas, closing certain trails, putting fences and barriers and really trying to put physical uh, means to keep people from impacting the resource and the degradation that uh, would be so hard to overcome and, and restore. I do think it's important to emphasize how this pandemic has underscored how the public parks shape our public health. And I won't go into this in large detail, but I think all of us have understood that the theories and the thought processes about forest bathing and all the studies about stress and so forth associated with um, state parks and the benefits and, of federal lands and the outdoors. But I think it's also in this time of COVID uh, given us more reason. I think if ever we were to a point of thinking parks are essential, uh, I think the public increasingly agrees with us now. So as I end, let me just say that uh, Several of these photos you've seen um, are from our national photo contest that we have every year. So I'll stop with that and just say, um, you got the end of the month, the end of the week. If you'd like to, uh, you've got a photo from a state park you'd like to enter, there's some great prizes. We'd love to see them. And um, uh, please call on me. And I look forward to uh, hearing more about these conversations about conservation. Thank you, Jordan, and all for uh, this opportunity. Great. Thanks so much, Lewis. It's really great to hear all these diverse perspectives from all over the country. Chris, I wanted to turn it over to you now. We talked a lot about in our classes these 
different actual management approaches of either concentrating and dispersing use and the ways that we can actually minimize all these impacts that are being caused by uh, these dramatic these dramatic increases in use and in what we've seen being presented today these increases in in the first time users i was hoping you could kind of give us some perspective on uh, what those approaches are and uh, the relative uh, drawbacks and, and advantages yeah thanks jordan and i'm sensitive to time so um i'll try to move forward with this uh fairly quickly um, as we've heard a number of the panelists say today, um, when we see increases in use, one of the things we're concerned about, in addition to providing a good experience for visitors, visitor safety, uh, but one of our primary concerns is impact to resources. And I uh, want to share with you today some perspectives on management strategies and what science can tell us in terms of resource impact. Um, so, first of all, I call myself a recreation ecologist. I'm an ecologist by training, and I work on recreation issues in our parks and public lands. And really what I'm mostly concerned about is this idea that recreation activities can act as disturbance agents to various ecosystem components. I want to also understand how when resources get affected, how that disturbance can affect the visitor. And of course, all of this leads us to some informed management strategies. Well, a long time ago, when I first got into the field, maybe some of you have seen this figure in uh, some of the literature or maybe in classes you've taken. Uh, we uh, often refer to this use impact generalized relationship, use impact theory. And this uh, relationship tells us basically that uh, the initial use that we might see in a location results in the majority of the impact. Now that might be a little different depending on the type of ecosystem we're talking about. But in general, that trend uh, does proceed to a point where if we continue to use that same location, uh, it's impacted and so as a consequence, we see very little change. Well, over the years, I've had the opportunity to test that theory in a number of places. And uh, a few years back, I published a paper along with some of my Australian colleagues in the Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. What we did in that paper is we looked across a number of different data sets to try to understand, did this use impact relationship really hold up? And here I'm demonstrating some data that I collected up in the uh, northern Alaska in uh, Gates of the Arctic National Park uh, that looks at the different intensities of disturbance, and we applied this experimentally, and then looks at the uh, relative cover loss that occurred in two Arctic tundra vegetation types. And in general, we see that there is this relationship. Uh, it might be slightly different shape, but that there is a period of very rapid change leading to a leveling off. Uh, we put this all together in our paper and uh, tried to describe some of the different use impact relationships. And we came to a couple of conclusions. Perhaps there are a number of different models, like maybe it's an S shape as opposed to this curvilinear uh, function that we first saw but that this idea, this generalization is still pretty useful and that uh, initially that use results in an awful lot of change. So what that leads us to from a management perspective is that high use situations oftentimes require spatial confinement of that use in order to minimize ecological disturbance. And when you look at the curve, this is the part of the curve where we would be in a high use situation. So these are impacted areas, putting more use on those areas results in little change. If we disperse visitors, it's only going to be effective if use is very, very low. Otherwise, we're going to see impacts proliferate in many places. So uh, you might say, well, is this going to be acceptable to visitors? And I think that is a good question. As we've seen in our discussions today, there's been lots of changes going on uh, with COVID, but I wanna share with you uh, to conclude a little bit of data on just this subject. 
So we did an extensive study in wildland parks that are urban proximate in Orange County, California. We found some interesting things when looking at visitor motivation on a quantitative scale. We found that the idea of solitude and escape was important, but it wasn't as important as getting exercise and visiting with friends and family. So this suggests to me that maybe there's some trends where solitude and this idea of getting away from people might be less important to people in many cases in our parks and protected areas. Uh, that I think we're right at two o'clock, so I will end it there. Chris, thanks so much for, for sharing your perspectives there. Um, I know we have a, had quite a few uh, questions come in for all of our panelists. Um, I'll just say, kind of given time, we're going to um, hold those questions and distribute them to our panelists, and then um, we will ask them to, to follow up with you as they have time later on. Um, I'll just say it's been great to, to kind of host this discussion. Um, we will make the recording available later on on the Conservation Conversations website. Um, as we've seen this huge um, audience uh, today, we are uh, really respective and really understand that this is a really timely topic and one that's not going to go away anytime soon. It's one that our parks and our public lands have been dealing with for a long time. Uh, so with that, we'll make sure that this recording gets shared um, with you on the website um, and then our, you can follow up um, uh, with either myself or our panelists later on if you have follow-up questions. Uh, so thanks for tuning in today. I'm going to turn it back over to Dominique, who has a couple final wrap-up remarks about the whole series. Thank you so much, Jordan, and thank you to our wonderful panelists today. It was really, truly a great uh, conversation. We've had lots of questions and, and requests for the slides, so uh, we'll try and share what we can. Just want to thank everyone for participating in this series. Uh, we will be sharing everything on the website and would love to hear your feedback. We'll do a survey in the next couple of weeks to everyone who attended um, a session, and we want to thank you for your time. Uh, with that, thank you so much for joining this final conservation conversation and have a lovely afternoon.